Hi there, everybody. It's Dale Beaumont here from Business Blueprint and welcome to our latest Business Blueprint webinar. So our special guest presented tonight, his name is Ed Chan. All right, Ed, over to you. G'day, Dale. G'day, listeners. Uh, welcome. Tonight will be mainly for small businesses. Let's, let's get on with it. This information I'm, I'm talking to you about is of a general nature. You need to get some personal advice to see it's applicable to you. Okay, the very first one I thought of was to use a trust as often as you can. Trust is a really flexible structure to use and there's lots of different types of trusts that you can use. However, the one that's most common to small businesses is a discretionary trust. Sometimes they call it a family trust because mostly families use it. And the reason why it's advantageous is because you can distribute the income to anybody that you decide that's in your family and so that if someone's on a lower tax bracket, you can distribute more to that person. And obviously, if someone's on a higher tax, you can at your discretion not distribute to them. So, so that's Ed, a very- uh, Can I just val- quickly ask how, um, when is the right time to set up a, a trust? We've got a number of well-established business owners, so it's probably right time for them now, but there's a few startups as well. So when is the right time and roughly how much does it cost? Yes, it's always best to start it up correctly from the start, because if you try to change something after you've started, it does cost more money. It can be done, but it's just a question of cost and it will cost you more. So getting the right advice from the beginning, setting it up correctly would save you a lot of time and frustration. But having said that, you can fix things if you've got it in the wrong entity, but it'll just cost you some some money, that's all. But yeah, right at the beginning. And when with the regards to the trust, basically the once you've set the trust up, the company is actually owned by the trust, right? So rather than the shares in your company being in your own personal name, it's your trust that actually, in a way, owns the company and uh, has the shares. Is that correct? That's one way to do it. So typically, clients will go along to their accountant and they'll say to their accountant, look, I'm going to buy this business or I'm going to start up a business. And the accountant will generally either set them up in a company and they'll go in as director of that company and they'll go in also as shareholders. If they were to set you up as a company, it's always best to have the shares in that company held by a trust and not by yourself. And the reason for that is is that when that company or that business becomes very, very valuable, then that share that's in your name becomes a very valuable asset. And then typically you'll be a director in your company. And as a director, you can get sued. And if your business grew from zero to $2 million and you held a share, that share is worth $2 million. And if you're a director of your company, then you can technically get sued. And then you've got $2 million uh, accessible to a creditor or someone who's taking action against you. So that's that's one way that you can set it up. The other way that you can set it up is having the trust own the business outright. And you then have to form a company as a trustee. So a company as a trustee is different to a company who trades on its own. So that's called a trading company. But the company that acts as trustee doesn't trade on its own. It actually trades on behalf of the trust. So the second way that you can do it is you can set up the trust to run the business. And then from that trust, you can then distribute income to your family members. Okay. Okay, uh, we know we've got other points, so we can't labor them too long. But the whole benefit of this is that you can distribute income to other parties to potentially lower your income tax, and also it does provide some asset protection as well in the case of you know a, a legal case. Is that they're the two biggest uh, advantages? Yes, and and just very quickly as an example, if you've got some adult children who may be at university, they're entitled. When I say adult, eight, eighteen years of age, they're entitled to the eighteen thousand two hundred dollar threshold income tax threshold before you pay any tax. So you can actually utilize their tax-free threshold to help you minimize your tax. And some people saying, if I don't have any kids or my kids are too young, anyone else? Can I rent uh, some yes, kids? Yes, uh, as long as they're related to you in some way or um, you know they, they fall within the trustees, uh, the trustees rules, then you can utilize them as well. Okay, fantastic. And once they, if they getting this income distributed, someone's asked the question, do they have to list this income on their tax return? Like, is it actually income to them? Yes, it is. It is income to them. So they have to declare that income. But if, as I said, if you're a, um, a student and uh, you may be earning a little bit of part-time income,
income, then you've got a threshold of 18,000 you can use, use up to. And of course, if you're earning a bit more than that, then you can give them sufficient distribution from the trust so that they don't pay more tax than you do. Uh, so you can manage your tax liability that way. The second one I thought of was using your cars. Everybody uses their cars and just the different ways that you can claim it as a tax deduction. And I'll break it into two. The first one is if you're an employee of a, a company, not your own company, but you know, you're working for someone and you're given a company car, the common way to do that now with fringe benefits tax is on a statutory method. Oh, actually, I'll better just explain fringe benefits tax. When you're using a car and there's private usage of that car, then you've got to pay a tax called a fringe benefits tax. If you're using it for business purposes, then there's, there's no fringe benefits tax. So that the FBT is only on a private usage of a car. So I'll just go back to what I, was, I started off by saying that so you, you can either be working for somebody and be provided a company car and there's going to be a fringe benefits tax calculated on it and most companies now use a statutory method especially when your kilometers are high and your business usage the percentage of your business usage is low they'll do it on a statutory method now the second part of that is when you're working for yourself and your business is run either through a trust or through a company and that business provides you with a car so you're required also to lodge a fringe benefits tax however what we do is we simply calculate it, calculate the private usage of that car and there's various different methods of doing that, either by a logbook or some sort of record to prove what is business and what is private. And the private portion is subject to fringe benefits tax. However, we reimburse the company with a personal reimbursement and we do that by journal entry and that gets rid of the fringe benefits tax. So effectively on paper, it's like there's a, I'm just making this figure up, there's a thousand dollar fringe benefits tax a fringe benefit liability and we do it by a journal if the company owes the shareholder some money you can offset what they owe or the shareholder or the employee actually physically puts some cash back into the company to eliminate the fringe benefits tax the reason why we do that is because when you reimburse it the tax rate is only 27 percent 27 and a half percent whereas the fringe benefits tax is over 48 odd percent makes sense interesting all right good the tax rates for individuals range from and i'll just quickly uh, share this with you from zero to eighteen thousand two hundred the zero tax from eighteen thousand two hundred to thirty seven thousand there's twenty one percent tax that includes a two percent levy and from thirty seven thousand to eighty seven thousand it's thirty four and a half percent including the levy from eighty seven thousand to one hundred eighty thousand it's thirty nine percent and above one hundred eighty thousand it's forty seven percent and as you can see the company tax rate is twenty seven and a half percent so from a sensible tax planning point of view and, and this is all legitimate legal and everything you can pay yourself sufficiently to keep you under those thresholds so you can keep yourself at around 34 percent up to 87,000 and between husband and wife that's double that that's 160 odd thousand and the rest if you left it in the company then you only pay tax at 27 half percent now the rules changed recently and they reduced the tax rate for businesses companies that, that run businesses from 30 percent down to 27 and a half but if your company is an investment company just invest in, in shares and the stock market or it buys a property and it's purely investment orientated then the tax rate is still 30 percent uh, but for businesses it's down to 27 half percent so ed what should we do if we start um you know we say we're paying ourselves the, you know, the 80 something and now our, our husband or wife's uh, our, our partners um you know another 80 it's 160 thousand we're drawing out as income we're paying a lot of personal expenses with that this money that stays in the company, obviously we, we pay our tax on it, then it, it stays in the company. What do we do? And what about if that money just keeps kind of like piling up, so to speak? What a good problem to have. Um, you know, then we want to kind of, uh, you know, do, then we want to either keep investing in our business, but when we start making profit, do we then take it out and then have to pay an additional sort of tax once it comes out of the business? Or we should be, should we be trying to invest it? Uh, back into say you know buying a commercial property and and leave it in the company and start building up assets within the company absolutely great question Dale. I'll answer in two ways the first one is if it allows you to manage your tax liabilities because even though you might pay 27 and percent tax in a company that tax unlike the tax you pay in your own name is gone but the tax you pay in a company isn't gone it sits there in the franking account so it sits there as a credit so somewhere down the track when you retire and your tax rate is less than 27.5%, you can take that money out as a dividend and pay no tax on it as long as your 
personal tax rate is the same as the company tax rate. If it's more than the company tax rate, you pay what's called a top-up tax, up to the, to the rate of tax that, you'll, that you pay personally. If your tax rate is less than 27.5%, you actually get a refund back. So it's, it's a fantastic vehicle to have for tax planning because then it allows you to determine what level of tax you want to pay. Unlike your personal tax rate, when, when, once you've paid it, it's gone. You, there's no credit, there's no franking credit, there's nothing. It's actually gone, completely gone away. Tax in a company, it's a good place to pay. But that's the first thing. The second thing is as you accumulate more and more money in a company, it's a really good idea to invest it. You can invest it through the company if your company isn't litigious in the, in the things that they do, or you can set up uh, various entities where the company can, for example, you can uh, buy your own premises and then uh, pay a rent from the company to say a super fund that may own the, 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 the premises. And, I, and I'll, I'm, I'll touch, I'm gonna touch on that in the, uh, another slide down the track. So I'll, you can invest the money from the company and you've just gotta make sure that there's asset protection um, structures in place because if the company got sued, then those assets that it invests in can potentially get lost in a, in a litigation. So we'd have to look at what, what it is that you want to invest in and how best to do it. But absolutely, the company can do that. And as long as the income comes back to the company, it's only taxed at 27.5%. The great thing about the company is that you can set up a self-managed super fund and you can put a, contra a, a contribution into, a super contribution into that superannuation fund. It's tax deductible in the company at 27.5% tax. So you're saving tax at 27.5%. But when it goes into your self-managed super fund, it's only taxed at 15%. So you can see that there's a, there's a differential in savings. Once it gets into the super fund, you can then buy property with it. You can buy your own office or your own factory or your business premises through there. And there's a special way that you do it. And, and I don't have time tonight to explain all that, but I'm just, just talking about it from a very broad point of view. So the benefit is that you can then pay rent to the self-managed super fund for the use of the office. And actually the rent is tax deductible in the business at a rate of 27.5%. So you're saving tax at 27.5%. And when the rent goes into the super fund, it's then taxed at 15%. And of course, when you retire later on and you draw a pension out of your self-managed super fund, all that income in that super fund is all tax-free. There are subject to some conditions. You can't be more than $1.6 million per member. And there's a whole lot of these conditions, but I won't go into it. We don't have time tonight to, to cover that off. However, just from a, from a very high level, the super fund is a very good way to minimize your tax and to be able to tax plan effectively around your businesses and you can utilize your business premises where if you're renting it and you're throwing good money to a landlord you can actually own it and make it very very tax effective okay great and the question that some people may be asking that haven't set it up when's the when's the right time you know should it be based on getting to a certain age or you know having a certain amount of money you know kind of like sitting in your company you know I don't know you probably may say you know the sooner the better but you know when is the right time to do it two answers to that uh, to answer two ways one is that if you were paying a lot of rent and you don't want to pay rent to someone you want to own the premises and you've got the ability to borrow the money because you've got to come up with a deposit uh, that's one time and then, and then the other time is that you know if you instead of sending your money out to a, a public fund you can then set it up to your own self-managed fund and generally for the second point if you have around 200 odd thousand in there it would make it uh, cost effective below that it may not be as cost effective to because there is a cost to running the self-managed super fund and at that level it'll make it cost effective however if it is if it's because you want to own your own business premises then you could do it sooner the way it's set up is through a bear trust so the bear trust owns the property and once the debt is paid off then the property then goes into the self-managed super fund why is it in a bear trust to start as opposed to being in the self-managed super fund from the start because the law states that the super fund can't borrow money unless it's through like an installment warrant and the bear trust is a installment warrant it's just a super fund rules that re require an installment warrant which the bear trust is if there's debt attached to the super fund so anyone that's looking to uh, buy a, a premises and then have rent paid back and can, can you actually pay a, 
over inflated rent? Is that kind of possible, or is it does it have to be like a market rate? No, it, it can't be a, a over over demand. It has to be a market rate. Everything has to be done at arm's length, and they're quite strict on that. So um, there's not much flexibility there. Okay, great. So anyone that's looking to um, self manage super fund, you see the benefits in the commercial uh, space, and the bear trust is a key word there to uh, talk to your accountant about or chat to um, to Chan and Ayla further. Claiming your home office and business premises and a portion of utilities, so tax deductible. There's two parts of that. There's a home office and a business office. So I'll just explain what I mean by that. Now, if the home office part, so if you're working for somebody else and you do a lot of work from home, so you might spend quite a few days a week at home, there are things that you can claim using your home as an office. The tax department has broken that up into two areas. They call it occupancy expenses and then running expenses. So I'll just cover off on the occupancy expenses. Occupancy expenses are things like insurance rates, a loan on your home, home mortgage, that's called an occupancy expense. And you can claim those, but you claim it on the basis of the floor area. So if you're using 15% of the floor area for your home office, you can claim that. However, when you come to sell the house, 15% of the house is then subject to capital gains tax. And then the second part of it, running expenses. Running expenses are like electricity, depreciation, cleaning, repair, those kind of things. And again, it's on a proportion basis, but you can claim those as an expense. It doesn't trigger a capital gains tax event when you sell your home. It's only the, the occupancy expenses that triggers a portion for capital gains tax when you sell your home. Okay, so I think pretty much everyone listening to this webinar, majority of people will be working for themselves, running their own business. Now, some are actually running that business from home. So does everything that you say stay, now, um, say so stand up? Uh, no, the business premises, which is the second part of the slide, do with, for example, a doctor may be working from his home. And if he is, pretty much the whole home is subject to capital gains tax, except for the portion that might make up his home. Again, make sure that you know you know what your floor space is and, and so forth. And if you're working from a, um, like I do, I ha go to an office that I, uh, you know, I lease for myself, which is good. <laughs> but, uh, you know, then, but when I go home, I do work at home as well. So that's where you're saying about the, the percentage of the utilities, the home office. You'd have to then claim it under the home office category. This is a really basic one, but lots of people don't pay attention to it. You might have some stock that's sitting on the shelf that's obsolete. If it's sitting there, then it's part of your closing stock and the higher your closing stock is, the higher your profit's going to be. So if the stock isn't being used and it's actually obsolete, if you write that off, then you reduce your stock take, the stock that you have on the shelves or on paper, and then that reduces your profit and that reduces, therefore reduces your tax. Also debtors, uh, sometimes the debtors are sitting in your accounts and you're trying to chase a bad debtor, someone that's not going to pay you or very doubtful of paying you. Writing it off, it would reduce your tax and it would reduce your income and therefore your tax. And if they then paid you later on, so if, you know, if they happen to pay you later on, then you just then bring it back in as income and pay the tax then at that point. Okay. Now, does this apply to service-based businesses as well? They may not have sort of like stock that they're selling, but they might have materials of certain kind that might become obsolete. Does this apply to a service-based business? Yes, it does. Whatever stock they have, and generally a service type business, even if it's a cleaning kind of business, the stock that they use or the material that they use is, is quite low. It's not, not a significant part of their business, but the same rules apply. Uh, but more significant to a service type business are debtors. So sometimes they owe quite a bit of money and it's taken a long time to collect it. And, and if it's doubtful, you can actually just write it off. Okay, but it's not to say that you're going to give up on chasing that money, are you? Still, gonna, no. <laughs> still got to try and get it in. That's right. You can buy negatively property in a property investor trust and distribute the income from your family trust to soak up the losses in the pit, the property investor trust. A negatively geared property is where the interest and expenses of the property is are higher than the rent they collect. So it's effectively making a loss and that, that loss can be claimed as a tax deduction. And as long as you do it in the, in the right way, then you can claim it. If you don't do it in the right way, for example, if you held a family trust, they held the property and the losses is in the family trust, but you're a salaried worker, then you won't be able to offset your salary against those losses, which are going to get trapped inside the family trust. However, if your business is also a family trust and you held your negative gear property in another family trust, you can actually distribute income from the first family trust to the lost family trust, the one that's making the loss, and soak up the negative gear in that way. The reason
reason why I put up the Property Investor Trust is that the Property Investor Trust is just something that Chan and Naylor developed and we've got a product running from the ATO, but it, we designed it specifically for property and I, I won't go into it tonight because tonight's not about property, but that'll be for another night. But the theory is still the same. So if you, if you bought a property in a family trust or a unit trust, if you held your business income in a trust, you can actually distribute that to that trust that's making a loss. And how's that different to the bear trust that you spoke about before for a, for a commercial property? A bear trust is a trust that effectively holds it on behalf of somebody else. Whereas a family trust or a property investor trust or a pit holds the property for themselves. Again, a bear trust doesn't hold a property on their own behalf. It holds the property on somebody else's behalf. For example, if you wanted to buy a property, but you didn't want it in your name. So the legal title you could hold in the bear trust, but the beneficial title to that property belongs to you because the bear trust, whilst the trust the, the property is in its name is not holding it on its own behalf it's actually holding it on your behalf whereas in a pit or a family trust it's holding that property in its own behalf all right makes sense but i'm sure that we've kind of lost a, a few people even sometimes for me this stuff is kind of like confusing so what situation should someone be in to come and talk to you about this issue specifically especially before they buy a property not after they bought a property that's very very important so you don't go to the auction and bid on the property and and they go sold. As soon as they go sold, they want the name to go on the contract of sale and you need to be prepared before you go to the auction. So it's best to go see your accountant and say to your accountant, I'm going to bid on this property on Saturday and I'd like to know what name to put it on because as soon as the auctioneer gives you and you've won the property on the day, you'll need to complete the contract of sale and you need to know what name to put on that contract. And once you put that name on the contract, if you want to change it, it's very, very difficult generally the vendors once they've got you as a seller they don't want anything to jeopardize it by putting it on a different name or whatever but it's always best as our parents used to say an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure so go see your accountant before you do anything not after you've done it and that could be for a home resident it could be for an investment property or it could be for a commercial property either way correct however it's more important if it's to do with business if it's your home it's important to know because if you're in a business that's highly litigious you may not want the property in your name because if someone sued you, if you're, say, a doctor or you're in business and you're a director of your company, then you don't want any assets in your name. Having your home in your name exposes the home to litigation and you could lose your home. I touched a little bit on this about a frank dividend. Sometimes you might have a company and you're running a business through the company and it's made a loss. And part of the loss that it's made is because you've paid yourself wages. And the more wages you pay yourself, the wages are tax deductible. The more wages you pay yourself, the higher that loss is. So in that situation, if your company is making a loss and you're paying yourself a wage, then you're actually paying tax on that wage that you're paying yourself. And the company's made a loss and it doesn't pay any tax, but you're paying tax in your own hands. So in that situation, it's better to pay a dividend rather than a wage because a dividend is not tax deductible but you still get the cash. Because it's not tax deductible, you're not increasing that loss in the company. You're making sure that you're paying the least amount of tax as possible. Okay, so pay a frank dividend instead of wages yeah. if you have tax losses in your company. Anything else that we need to know about that one before we move on? You need to do a bit of tax planning before the end of the year. So a good time is around April, May. Go and see your accountant. Have a look at the accounts and see how they're traveling. If you look like you're in a loss situation, you can stop you know, any more wages and and turn the wages that you've paid yourself into a dividend. So the tax planning is all before the end of the year, not after the end of the year. So do all your tax planning then, because once 30th of June comes and goes, it's too late. And you won't be able to do the tax planning after that. So you should really just make sure if they, people get one thing from this webinar, it's to book a meeting with your accountant in May every single year and make sure you sit down and go, how can you help me? Absolutely. So we do that with our clients. So we do some interim accounts with them. We do the tax plan in that part of the year. So we sit down and do all the tax planning around April, May. So we know what to do between April, May to June. And we make sure that they all get done before the 30th of June comes and goes. Don't own the shares in your company in your own name. Unfortunately, many clients go to accountants and they might have just started their business and it's not worth anything when they first start it. So the accountant says, let's 
start a company for you. We'll put shares in your name and your wife's name. You know, it's a two dollar company. Ten years later, that business is worth four million dollars. Those two shares are now worth two million dollars each. They also happen to be a director in their own company, and as a director, you can get sued. And if you get sued and you've got a share that's worth two million dollars, and some have their own homes in their own name, that's not good either. It's very costly to fix that up. So do all the planning up front. Make sure it's set up correctly right in the beginning. It'll minimise a whole lot of uh, costs and taxes in uh, trying to fix it up because to try and then move those shares that are in mum and dad name into a trust, it triggers capital gains tax and a whole lot of legal costs and so forth. So it's a very costly exercise. It's it's you can fix it, but it's very costly. Okay, so someone asked the question. You know, they they have like I did. You know, at the beginning, I made this mistake um, until you helped me to fix it. You know, of putting the shares in my own name. I now own no shares in my own company, but my trust does. How do you fix it? When should you fix it? You should fix it as soon as you can, because the longer you leave it, the worse it will get. How you fix it, it just depends on the circumstances of the client. And I couldn't tell you because everybody's circumstances are completely different. But you need to go to an accountant who knows what they're doing and just sit down and go through your your situation and uh, work out a way to do it. There's various different ways to do it, subject to the client situation will then determine how they do it. Okay. So, and and with regards to the cost of, of setting up a family trust, is it a couple thousand dollars to, to do or a few hundred? Yes, to set up a trust, you'll have a company as a trustee. So that's around twelve, fourteen hundred dollars around that kind of figure. And then the trust range is between around five hundred dollars and twelve hundred dollars. Depending on what state you're in. So in New South Wales there's a five hundred dollar stamp duty. So to add significantly to the cost of the trust. But in South Australia there's no stamp duty. So it just depends on which state you're in as to actual cost of the trust itself. And I just realized we've got a few Kiwis uh, listening as well. I'm guessing some of the same principles will uh, apply with regards to, you know, not having shares in your own name and, you know, about, uh, you know, your business buying uh, commercial property, etc. So I just probably should have mentioned that, you know, up front that even though there might be specific things that apply just to Australia or just to um, like the percentages, but there's the principles are going to be pretty uh, pretty sound across Australia and New Zealand. Is that right? Uh, yes, the principles are basically the same. There are differences between the two countries. For example, GST in New Zealand is, is a lot simpler than ours. They also have trusts that are, are taxed, I believe. And so they're just minor sort of things that are a little bit different, but the, the principle is the same, yes. And so yeah, you'll probably maybe be looking at sort of you know three grand as a sort of starting point to uh, to do the whole family trust uh, setup but obviously it, that is kind of like an expense but if you are having a business that in the future you you do hope will be worth hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars it's a small price to pay you know now compared to when your company is actually worth a lot of money if labor gets in they talk about taxing trusts like a company so uh, the benefits of a trust may disappear if, if the labor government gets in we touched on this earlier use your adult children as beneficiaries in your family trust because they have a threshold but if they're under 18 they're only allowed to get $416 that's $416 before the tax rate jumps to 66 cents in a dollar it was their way of stopping families from you know, distributing to minors and once upon a time when I first came into the industry you could distribute to your kids and it didn't matter what age they were or whatever we used to if you had four kids you distribute to the four kids and pretty much wipe out your tax. And then they brought this law in that said that if you're under 18, then it's a 66% tax bracket income over $416. So, so you've got to be careful not to give it to them if they're uh, very young uh, or you can give them $416. And, and of course, it just makes you tax plan a little bit more carefully, that's all. But you can still utilise the laws that are there to, to your advantage. And you said they don't have to be your own kids, is that right? <laughs> no, it's best that they are your own. Kids, <laughs> but yes, if they're in the trust deed and then they're mentioned or they're part of the family, then can take advantage of that. Okay, the very last one is traveling allowances. Yay. Um, so this could us... be coming to like our conferences if you're from interstate, right? Yes. Or it could be going yes. overseas. We've got a conference coming up in Thailand in April, and then of course, many people would be going on a, a family holiday a couple of times a year. So I'm very yes. keen to know about this one. Yes, it's called a reasonable travel allowance, and the tax department has tabled where if you go to a certain city or you go to a certain country, they allow you a certain amount that you can claim without having to justify it. 
So for example, you can go into the ATR website, it's called TD2017-19. So if you go in there, you can, you can look at the table and all the numbers are there. But basically, just to explain how it works, if you were to go to Adelaide, for example, you can claim $285.70 as a daily allowance. Now let's say your employer gave you $200 to go there every day of a day. You have to show that as an income, but then you can claim $285.70 as a tax deduction. So if you were there for 10 days and you got $2,000 for traveling allowance, but you can actually claim more than that up to the allowance that the ATO has stipulated. So I'll just read out some of the other states like Darwin is $344.70, Melbourne is $301.70, Sydney is $313.70. And that's if you're earning an income of up to $120,000. If you earn more than $120,000, so up to $212,000, that daily rate goes up. Okay, so if people are coming to Sydney four times a year for our conferences, some people are coming for you know five days at a time with a travel day on the other side. So that could be 20 days of the year. So that kind of adds up, right? Yes, it does. But there is a condition that has to be for work. For conferences, if it's to do with your work, then they look at it separately. It's a little bit complicated, but make sure they get some advice from their accountant before they claim it. But while they're coming to our conferences, they're also networking and they're also telling people about their business. They're handing out business cards. They're doing prospecting and marketing for their business, right? Can you claim it that way? Uh, yes, you can. That's a business expense. So you wouldn't claim it under traveling. You would claim it under business expenses. Nice. All right. And what about if you know some of the stuff is like family holiday stuff as well? Is that like absolutely no go? Or, you know, is there a way that you could make it into having a business reason to travel? They're pretty strict on it now. If you even with rental properties now, they've now cut a lot of that out. The new rules cut out uh, incidental business trips that are claimed where the predominant purpose is private. They won't allow that now. So again, you, it's all comes back to your paperwork. So if your paperwork is good, then it's a matter of just sitting down with your accountant and making sure that your paperwork complies so you won't get in trouble. Good. And then someone's asked the question, how much can we claim for overseas business travel? When it comes the cost of the travel, like your airfares and so forth, they're all tax it up. As long as they're related to business, if it's all related to business and you've got a diary that shows that, then the cost of that is is all deductible to you. But you have to be able to justify that it is business related. Okay, so keeping a diary and make sure that you, you know, collecting business cards from people, you know, taking photos of the business activities that you're doing is all about like being able to prove that what your intention is around that travel. That's right, exactly. Okay, there's a couple of questions here. Uh, what is the case if you and your partner are both directors and you have to take your children with you? The children is not tax deductible, even though you can't leave them at home, they're still not tax deductible. Even the uh, suits, you know, sometimes like me, I've got to wear a suit for work, that's not tax deductible. What about if you get your logo on the suit? Yes, if you put your logo on the suit, you can claim all the cleaning and, and, and all that. That's In fact, that's why we have a logo on our suit. So as long as there is. The theory is that if you can wear it outside, it waters down your claim but if you can't wear it outside the company logo on it then it, it is business so just having like initials on the uh, sleeve probably doesn't count not including a tattoo you can't tattoo your arm and then claim all your food that you feed yourself <laughs> that would be fun. Uh, with overseas uh, if the conference is a two-day conference so you're going to America the conference is two days but you know you need a couple of days before to get over jet lag maybe a couple of days after to network with people that you've met at the conference how many days can you turn that into if the conference is two days? The predominant trip has to be business. Now, if the predominant trip was private and the business side of it was just incidental, then you won't you won't get it as a deduction. If the business trip is the predominant reason for going over there, you will get the business portion as a deduction and then there'll be a private portion as well for the days. But if you're going there and it's taking you two days to get there, but the whole trip was to do with business, then the whole thing is deductible. It doesn't matter how long it takes to get there, but if the whole trip was to do with business, then the whole thing is deductible. So, you know, if you had to have a day or two layover because there was no other flights available, then you might be able to make it work. Yes, that's <laughs> correct. If you did a lot of private things, then yes. it's questionable, yeah.